Hello chess friends! In this video I'm going to be going over some of the decisive moments from the final two games of the Julius Bayer Generations Cup online tournament between Carlsen and Aragaisi. But before I do that, I want to share with you something interesting I did. I was listening to a conversation between Danny Wrench of Chess.com and Hikaru Nakamura where Danny Wrench was talking about how you can catch chess cheats by looking at what he called their DNA profile. That is the specific way that their chess moves will match up with a chess engine's first choice, second choice, third choice, etc. For example, what percentage of the time is a player choosing the engine's first choice? What percentage of the time is the player choosing the engine's second choice, third choice? On down the list. And there's sort of an expected distribution, which I think would vary a little bit from player to player based on your style, based on your abilities. But I think among players of the same rating, there's a range that you expect those percentages to fall. Okay, so let me show you what I'm talking about. What I did is in the two games between Carlsen and Aragaisi, I went through each move from each player, and with Stockfish running, I wrote down how many times each player's move lined up with Stockfish's first choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice, fifth choice, and at the end I tallied it all up and I recorded the percentages. And the result was pretty interesting. You can see that Carlsen is choosing the first choice of Stockfish 62% of the time, as opposed to Aragaisi only 54%. Now the second choice, they're pretty close. Carlsen's a couple percentage points higher on the third choice. All the rest of them are pretty close, so the biggest difference is that first choice selection. And you can see the total here. Carlsen chose one of the engine's top five moves 90% of the time, whereas Aragaisi chose the top five move only 83% of the time. So next I got a little bit curious to see how my percentages compare to these guys. So I took a couple of my online rapid games and I did the same thing. So you can see on the right hand side here where I've included my percentages. And it's very interesting. The biggest difference of course is how often I choose Stockfish's first choice. Much lower. But the second, third, fourth, and fifth choice you can see that that's actually higher. Like my second choice is higher than these guys. Which kind of makes sense because all those moves that I would have chose the top engine choice if I was a stronger player, instead those are being replaced with second choice, third choice, fourth choice, and on down the line. Those percentages are going to be a little higher. It looks like around fifth choice, maybe, maybe sixth, seventh choice, it's close to the same. But then if you extend this list down even further, you're going to start to see how at like the 20th choice, 30th choice, it's going to be much more often that I'm picking those catastrophic blunders than these guys. So that's the missing piece of the puzzle. But this got me to thinking that if you were to try to cheat and supplement with a computer engine here and there, it would be very easy to mess this up and throw up a red flag. And this is what Danny Wrench was talking about where there's a DNA profile and there's an expected way that each of these percentages are going to change. So if I were to try to cheat and just every now and then pick the engine's top choice, and maybe this 37% goes up to 45%, and then these other percentages don't change the way they should, maybe they should be going down but they're not, you know, it's very easy to throw up a, a red flag that could be obvious to someone who is familiar with how these percentages typically change as a player increases their rating in a natural way and not with engine assistance. Now suppose I were to try to be tricky and say, okay, I'm going to alternate between using the engine's first choice and second choice once in a while. This could throw up a very clear red flag. Maybe this 24% would go up to like 32%. And maybe that's outside of the range of any normal chess player. Because the natural way for this to progress, if I was to get better naturally, would be for this percentage to creep up, maybe this goes up to 45%, and then maybe this goes, the second choice goes down to 22%, and maybe the third choice goes down to 9%. So for a chess cheat to be successful, they would have to be aware of these statistical patterns, and they would have to make sure that their percentages are changing in an expected way. So I thought that was very interesting. Maybe in a later video I'll do another breakdown like this with much more data. I looked online and tried to find some information on this, but I don't know that people that are highly educated in this kind of thing necessarily want to share this information because it would probably only serve to help chess cheaters cheat more effectively. Anyway, let's get on to the games. Carlsen versus Aragaisi. I'm gonna focus on some key positions and decisive moments. Okay, so in game number one, Aragaisi has white, and Carlsen plays the Pertz defense. The only redeeming thing about this opening for black is that you can play it against e4 or d4. 
Other than that, it's known to be rather substandard because white just has so many good attacking options. But Carlson's saying, you know what? I know I'm going to win, so let's just make it interesting. And he's not even being overconfident either. I'm surprised he didn't play something like the Bond Cloud. Wouldn't that be something, huh? Carlson defeats Aragaisi with the Bond Cloud. Be something to take our mind off all this other chess drama. Give us something else to talk about. But anyway, we have this standard idea where white will attack on the king side and black will counter with the queen side attack since that's where white castled. And we got knight b1 and Carlson continues to push on the queen side. Knight h3 from Aragaisi. You might think, why not knight e2? Well, then there's knight c4 forking the queen and bishop and if you try to defend the bishop with this there's like bishop a6 setting up a discovered attack it's very nasty so knight h3 is the best way to develop the knight and now d5 from carlson which the engine doesn't like at all it thinks you should play bishop e6 or h5 to try to stop this expansion of the pawns on the king side but after d5 e5 is played by air guy see that's what the engine likes it likes that central expansion, and then the knight goes here to block the move h5. If you went knight d7, then you could play h5. You don't want that. So you're just trying to hold things up over here on the king side. And now we got queen e1 to prevent knight to g3, forking the bishop and rook. Now the engine likes queen to f2 for some reason. I couldn't really figure out what the big difference was. And then I looked at some long variation where the queen is supporting the move f4. So go figure, but this is a fine move. Bishop takes h3. Carlson does not want g4 followed by that knight jumping to g5. That's just another attacking piece for white. So he's just going to go ahead and eliminate that knight. And now knight g7 because he knows g4 is coming. So you might as well anticipate that move. And here, Aragaisi goes wrong with bishop h6, giving up his little bit of an advantage he had developed there. h5 would have been the best attacking option. And this is common in a lot of Sicilian dragon games where you sack the pawn, but then you drive the knight away and you have this nice open file to work with. The attack on the file is worth it. But bishop h6 just allows knight e6, and the engine says it's just equal now. Bishop takes f8 is played, and it's true black can't castle anymore on the king side, but black doesn't want to castle on the king side. Not with what's going on with these pawns. His king is actually safer in the center here, especially since the center is kind of blocked up here. These two pawns are immobilized. Rook h2. Now this might seem a little weird. Um, I didn't understand it at first. Why make that move now? But eventually this c5 pawn is going to be traded off and this file is going to open and it's going to help defend c2. I believe that's what's going on here. Queen c7. H5, okay, good move. Looking to open this file. C5, now black's going to open a file. Pawn takes, queen takes, pawn takes here, pawn takes here. G3, so the plan is to get this structure here. G3 defending F4. If you wait, though, then there's this knight D4 move, and then it's hard to play G3 anymore because then F3 is under attack. So it's good to get that move in now. Rook C8, now you get F4. You get this nice solid pawn chain here. Knight D4, queen F2, attacking the knight. Now here Carlson finds a very nice move. It's not winning, but it makes life difficult for Aragaisi. It gives him only one move that doesn't lose at this point. Aragaisi did not find the correct move. See if you can find the correct move. What should white play here? Here the only move that does not lose is knight to c3. Let's look at some other options. First of all, a4 was played in the game, which just drops his pawn on c2. If you try to play A takes B3, see if you can spot black's move. I'll give you one and a half seconds. Knight B3 check is mate. Okay, so that's not working. What about C3? Well, anytime you allow B takes A2, this pawn cannot be stopped. It will become a queen. So that's not working. You really need to play Knight C3 here. And this Knight is under attack. So let's say you take the pawn. Well, Rook takes D4. You just want a piece. Let's say you try to take this pawn. Then you go queen takes, rook takes, you can throw in a check here, and then you can grab this pawn here, and then the knight needs to get out of danger, and then something like this. White is okay here. If you try b takes a2 here, of course the knight is watching over that square now, so you're okay. If you try to take here with the knight, it's not working. There's not enough coverage because we're going to take here and we're going to win the piece. If you try this knight b3 check, of course the king can just move. Unfortunately, Aragaisi did not find that knight c3 move. He played this a4 move. 
which allows queen takes c2 check, grabbing a pawn. Now the engine likes knight takes c2 a little bit better. I don't know, just to keep more pieces on the board. Well, you can take right here, but what's the deal here? I don't know. Helps black develop the rook, whatever. Let's move on. You got queen c2 check, queen takes, knight takes, bishop b5, king here. Now knight c3 is played at this point because we don't want any discovered checks once this knight moves. And you're developing again. So e6, defending that pawn. King b1, because the plan is for white to play e2 to c1. Try to win this pawn. Try to get the pawn back. And of course you want to get the king off that file. You don't want the discovered check. King e7, knight e2 played. We're going to go after this pawn here. Putting the rook to an open file. A couple rooks come off the board. Knight c1 going after that pawn. Knight e3, attacking the rook. Rook to e1, and the knight goes here. The unfortunate thing about this position for white is that although white can win this pawn, it takes a little bit of time, and in the meantime, black is getting activity, so what he does is he starts to target this pawn. So we get this, but then rook h2, hitting this pawn. King c1 is played. Now, a lesser player would play something like knight takes b2, but this is not what black should do at this point, because this allows rook e2. And it forces a trade of rooks after takes, takes. You can get this pawn, but then white's going to end up getting the a5 pawn. And this is not so easy to win for black. Carlson wisely keeps more pieces on the board. The same kind of problem happens after if you take with the rook. Now the knight can grab here, the rook can go here. We end up with some exchange of minor pieces. And a situation like this, rook d1, and this is dead drawn with the rooks. So Carlson. He knows that he needs to choose the right moment to take out that pawn, and Aragaisi gives him that moment. He blunders with rook to f1. So what's the deal with this? Rook d1 would have been fine. Again, if you go like this, rook d2 forces a trade of rooks, and we see a similar variation to what we saw. But after rook f1, knight takes b2. Now there is no way to force the trade of rooks, and we get this line where the knight takes on a5, and then the black knight takes here, and with the knights and the rook, black has enough activity with this passed pawn, and he's going to target these pawns over here with his knight and rooks, and he's going to win. If you try to exchange pieces like even doing this, you can't hold this as white because the knight's going to come into c5, then it's going to come to e4, and just target these pawns over here, and black has a winning game. So what's played is rook to f3, and then here we go, knight c5, coming to this beautiful e4 square. Rook c3, white is going to try to get some activity. What happens is the knight targets this pawn. Okay, rook b3, okay, getting both the pieces attacking that pawn. And then bishop a6, attacking the knight on b6, which moves out of the way. Rook b8 check, king g7, and then Aragaisi decides that he's going to go for some counterplay over here. Try to get some activity with his rook and knight. Knight c5 played. Unfortunately, even with this aggressive looking check, the king has enough squares and will not get checkmated. And actually, Aragaisi decides to sacrifice his bishop on a6 just so he can get one pawn, check, king moves, two pawns with check. Now he's got a pawn for his sacrificed piece, but this is not going to turn out well. He goes over here, knight a to c5, and then in a desperate bid to get a passed pawn, hopefully, he plays this f5 move, maybe hoping for this, and then maybe this pawn could someday advance. But Carlsen's not going to do that. Because Carlsen is not the kind of player who misses a checkmate in three moves. See if you can spot it. What's Black's first move? It starts with knight d3 check, and at this point, Aragaisi resigns, because what's coming is king b1, knight c3 check, king a1, rook g1 mate. A nice finish by Carlsen, who played this game very accurately, even though, according to Stockfish, he did let his opponent get an early advantage with this e5 move. But at this point, I don't even know if I trust Stockfish when it disagrees with Carlsen, because everything turned out just fine in this game. And Carlsen is what, like up around 2,900 now? Maybe over 2,900 after this tournament? So on to the next game. The final game of this tournament. This time Carlsen has the white pieces, and we have what it's telling me is a modern Benoni but then it looks like it transposes into some kind of King's Indian. I'm not real familiar with either opening because I never start with d4 as white, and I always play d5 as black in response to d4. But I do know that they're following pretty 
standard opening theory here. Until this move, knight b to d7 by Eric Icy, which is a mistake. It's not so obvious to see why that's a mistake. If you're not familiar with this opening, take a minute, see if you can find white's best response to this. Knight h3 gives white a powerful advantage because you're going to go to f2. That would not be possible if this knight wasn't here blocking this bishop, which could just take out the knight and damage white's pawn structure. But knight f2 is the ideal square to develop that knight, apparently, because you keep this bishop open. So after knight b to d7, if you were to go knight g e2, this is inferior because knight e5, looking to hop into c4, and you got to take a move to prevent that with like b3 or something, but then black starts in with b5. Or you can move the knight to g3, but then like h5, looking to kick the knight around. It's just much nicer to take a move to get it to h3, then go f2, and it's just the perfect way to develop your pieces. And it's saying Carlson has, you know, almost a one pawn advantage. Which seems crazy here, but, you know, that's how important opening theory is. You just mess up one little detail like that. And Carlson, he knows exactly what to do. He puts the knight on f2. h5 now. Now, you might be wondering back here if there was an opportunity to win a pawn. Instead, instead of knight h3, what about this bishop takes h6 move? Take a minute and see if you can figure out what's wrong with this move. Black has a tactic. Knight takes e4. And if you take, there's this queen to h4 check, and then black is going to get the piece back. Equalizing the material, and if anything, this positions in black's favor. So just in case you were wondering about that bishop takes h6, a6, and after knight f2, now it's necessary to defend with h5 because there's no more queen h4 check since the knight's on f2. a4 is played to stop the expansion with b5, and now we got rook to b8. Bishop e2, knight to e8, opening the diagonal for the bishop, looking to redeploy to c7. The castle, knight c7, bishop g5 attacking the queen, queen moves. Now bishop h6. Not a bad plan at all. If you can eliminate this bishop, then black will have some weak dark squares around his king. It's usually a good thing to do with the fianchetto bishop by the king. We got takes, takes, and now queen to e5 is the best move, according to the engine, and white is still better. But after b5, what Irigaisi plays, white is just winning here. Carlson plays a takes b5, followed by a takes b5. This is good. And then goes rook to a7. Attacking this knight. This is totally winning. But even stronger here would be f4. So what's the deal with this? b4. And what do you think white's strongest move is right here? e5 is so powerful that you can even sacrifice the knight. Pawn takes and knight to e4. It hits d6, and more importantly, it's threatening to come into g5. And that is a threat that you don't have a good way to deal with. You can take here, don't care about pawns, go into g5. And there is knight f6, which defends against this checkmate. But after pawn takes, queen takes, you're going to take out that knight with your rook. And now black has to do something crazy like this and sack the queen in order to avoid checkmate. So that would have been Carlson's most powerful move f4 right there but rook a7 is still totally winning here and the problem is this knight is under attack so black has to go for this losing combination with b4 if you try to defend that knight let's say queen d8 the problem with this is the queen has double duty because we're going knight h3 and we're going to hop into g5 and you want to defend by going like this and this getting the queen to g7 which you can't do because the queen's tied down to defending that knight and how are you going to def You can't play this, or else queen takes g6. So this is really the best hope, is just to counterattack. And let white grab the knight on c7. Black gets the knight here on c3, and ends up white's a pawn up here. The rook gets some activity, but it's not a problem. And then Carlson just proceeds to convert this position. And he's got this active rook. He's got the extra pawn. He ends up playing e5 here. If you take, we're going knight g4, hitting the queen. And then after the queen moves, we grab the, grab the pawn so you're not winning a pawn. Queen d8 is played. Rook goes here. And we have f5, just looking to break up the structure around the king. And once the king's weakened, then it's just, uh, it's just a matter of mopping up the mess black has created for himself. 
or does that even make sense? I don't know. Okay, so I don't know. There's not a whole lot more to talk about. It, what's interesting, though, is that the material's even, but just because of the weak king, this knight's pinned for the moment. You know, only a player like Magnus can play a position like this with so much confidence. I would be thinking that I'm going to mess something up and let Black get away with the draw. But no, Carlson, he's, he's playing all the right moves. And how does this end here? Okay, so he has a pawn. And the king's very weak. It's getting checked. Then he grabs another pawn. So he ends up with two pawns. And then Black goes for this crazy sacking the knight. But it doesn't really work because after this check, maybe he's hoping for perpetual. But this right here, this forces a trade of queens. And now it's just over. So such convincing play by Carlson, just demonstrating that he is just head and shoulders above anyone in the world. It's going to be interesting to see how long it's going to be till anyone gives him some serious challenge. And should they even hold the world championship since he's not participating? Should they even call it that? Maybe they should call it something else. I feel like they should. But anyway, thanks for watching. Please consider subscribing to the channel. I'll be making a lot more really awesome videos like this one almost every day, if not every day.